Good morning. It's good to see you guys here. Um, it's been a, a ridiculously long week for me. Um, if you know what's happening in our world, you know why. But uh, this, these things called sinuses last Sunday um, attacked with a vicious, I don't know, I lost the words for that, but they, they were, it was powerful and it knocked me down. Um, so if my voice cracks like a 12-year-old this morning, you keep those Snickers to yourself. And if I break into a cough that goes for three or four minutes, that's just three or four minutes longer that I'll talk later. Um, so this morning, we're going to Hebrews, because uh, we've been there for a while, uh, chapter 11. We won't stay there long, um, but I do want to read a verse from there um, in Hebrews chapter 11. And just real quick, I have so enjoyed this series that we've been in, working through um, really the, just the Old Testament, this sort of broad overview of, of these stories that some are very familiar to us, some maybe not so familiar, but it just gives us that foundation that we can stand on. Um, to know where our faith comes from. Um, and here in Hebrews, as we look at the context of this passage, the writer is speaking to people who are, are Jewish people. They know these stories by heart. They memorize them as children. It's the foundation of all that they knew. And so when the writer of Hebrews is bringing all these people up, Man, it's just bringing like the, that flood of memories from their childhood. Um, but these are not just Jewish people. They're, they're Jewish people who have decided that Jesus really is the Messiah, that they're going to submit their life to following him, becoming like him in all that they, um, in all that they are and all that they do. And so these Jewish people are... They believe in this Messiah. They're Christians now. They're, they've taken on this new identity. And, and because of that, they're experiencing persecution from this Roman Empire. And, and so the writer of Hebrews is writing this letter to them to encourage them to stand firm in their faith. Um, and, and we see, um, I think it's in chapter 10, um, he says these things that you've experienced all sorts of, of persecution, that you've stood with those who are in prison, that you have stood with those who are suffering, um, and, and that you've had compassion on those in prison and joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. These people have been going through serious persecution. He's saying, don't waver in your faith. Stand firm. And this is why. And so he jumps into this passage about all these people who have gone before, who have held on to their faith. And so today we're going all the way down to verse 31. Now so far we've looked at, um, we've looked at kind of these major stories of the people of Israel. Most of us are probably familiar with the parting of the Red Sea in some sort of way, or Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, those guys. Today, we're taking this step into some of those lesser-known stories. And from here, the writer of Hebrews kind of picks up the pace, and he doesn't even tell stories. He just starts naming people. Um, he skips over a lot of people, actually, that, that we might pull up. But right there in verse 31 of Hebrews 11, it says, By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So we've like barely begun here today and already we have a little bit of scandal in the story. Like when we were flipping through and I was like, oh, I'm going to be at Hamilton Road on, on the 29th. What am I teaching on? No, awesome. <laughs> Rahab the prostitute. <laughs> like there's just really no good way to like clean this up, you know? Like, and, and we'll talk about why that's important not to do so, but um, so I apologize if there are younger people in here, but we're going to talk all about this today. So um, we, we want to go back to Joshua chapter 1. Um, last week we looked at uh, the fall of the walls of Jericho. That actually happens in Joshua 6, I believe. We're moving back to Joshua 1, to, uh, the writer of Hebrews. I, maybe he got confused and left this part out. But um, So jumping back to, to Joshua, I want to give you a little context here. Um, God is bringing the people of Israel finally into that promised land, that covenant that he made with Abraham um, so many hundreds of years uh, previous to Joshua here in this book. He made a covenant. I am going to give you a land. You will be my people. This will be your land. This will be set apart for you. You will be a set apart people. Um, and, and so he made that covenant. That covenant continued to pass down through the generations. This is a big deal. Um, but now we've gotten to this point where Moses has died. Um, in fact, Joshua opens with that. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, uh, that's a lot of descriptors. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, 
go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving them to the people of Israel. Verse 3, I love this. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you just as I promised to Moses. That's that covenant being reiterated to this generation, being promised again to a new generation of Israelites. He goes on in verse 5, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of the sun shall be your territory. Oh, wait, I did a wrong line there. All the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. It just continues to say this, encouraging them. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Uh, Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This reminds me of that language that was used at the Red Sea. The people of Israel are standing there looking at the sea before them. And they're looking behind them and the Egyptian army is pursuing them and they're wondering what to do. And as I studied that passage, the language that God says is, don't be afraid. Stand and be silent and watch what the Lord will do for you. I mean, how powerful is that? You don't have to do anything. Watch what I'm going to do to rescue you. And he's saying the same thing to this generation of Israelites here, that I will bring you into this land. Every place that your foot touches, I'm going to give you. I'm going to do the work and go ahead of you. So Joshua tells the people essentially, get ready. Um, we're going to take possession of the land. And that's kind of the language he used. I love that word, take possession. Um, so this is what happens. He decides to send spies into the land again. This happened 40 years earlier. Joshua and this other guy, Caleb, were a part of these spies that went into to Canaan, into this promised land. They examined it. They came back. Two people said, we can take this land because of what God will do for the people of Israel. And the rest of the spies said, we can't take this land. There are giants in it. There are scary people. No way. We're not doing it. What happens? A whole generation of Israelites has to die. Forty years wandering in the wilderness. Except Joshua and Caleb remain. And then Joshua inherits this leadership position. And now he's sending spies into the land because he knows that it's time to take possession. And so chapter 2 Getting into the story here. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly. I guess, I guess you want to send less people in. Like the first time the majority overruled. You know, like we got to make sure that we don't ruin this again. So he sends two men in saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab. And they lodged there. Now, as I read through this, the first thing I thought was, why is that like the first place you thought we should stop here like let's let's camp out here for the night and and see what happens Um, and it's like these are the people of Israel Moses gave them the law on the mountain he came down and he said these are the things you can do these are the things you cannot do what they're doing here fit into the not do category Like, this is not a place that you should be staying. And I've thought over and over this, like, why would they have stopped there? Like, what good is in this? And there is no answer. Scripture doesn't give us any, except for the fact that we know Rahab becomes a significant part of the story, and God is at work. And so even though these two guys make a terribly poor decision, um, God redeems this. So um, it's found out that the men are there and the local authorities come and they knock on Rahab's door and they're saying, hey, we know, we know that there are some spies in there and you need to bring them out to us because we're going to deal with them. So let's read in Joshua 2, 8 through 14, if you have your Bible or your phone, whatever you want to pull out. Joshua 2, 8 through 14, I just want to read this with you. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof. Rahab has sent them up to the roof. She's going to hide them. Before the two men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard about it, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign 
that you will save alive my father and my mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. So we have a story of a prostitute. The local people come and they say, We want these spies that are in your house. And she says, They're not here. They've gone down the road. You should go after them quickly. Maybe you'll catch them. I thought about that too. Like, that should only work in a cartoon. But here it works. Um, and so we have a conspiracy. We have deceit. We have a prostitute. There's like all kinds of scandal in this story. And, and we get here and, and Rahab is looking at these men of Israel. And she says, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And that the fear of you has fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. We heard about the parting of the Red Sea. That was kind of a big deal. News travel. We heard about how you destroyed those two cities. It's like God keeps doing these things ahead of you. When we look at that passage of the Red Sea, there are, are at least three times, if not more, where God says, Hey, Moses, go to the Red Sea. I'm going to do something big that's going to bring glory to me. It's not so much about you walking across a Red Sea as it is about me receiving glory. And he says, I'm going to do this so that the Egyptian people know about me, about my glory. And he does this so all the inhabitants of the earth know about himself and his glory. And, and that happened that day there at the Red Sea. And here it is happening again from the mouth of this prostitute who is saying, we heard about your God. We know what he can do. We know how powerful he is. We know that he is the God in the heavens and he is the God of the earth beneath. We know what he can do in the skies and we know what he can do on land. We know that you just so happened to be slaves not too long ago and God rescued you out of that and here are the things that he has done and leading you to this point so that you are here at Jericho. And it's interesting that Rahab continues to use this language um, of Yahweh. If we look in the passage, you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Anytime you see that in the Old Testament, that's his personal name for who God is. She is calling out the name of the Israelite God, this name that they would not even use. And she's saying, we know who he is and what he has done. And that's very significant to me that she is able to see this and recognize it and call the glory of God down. And honestly, I think you could just stop here and look at how God receives his glory through all that he is doing. But there's this beautiful story of redemption that's kind of underneath all that's happening here. And that's where we're going to go to. Uh, verses 12 through 14. Um, in that section there, she kind of, she makes a deal with them. She says, hey, look. I protected you guys. I'm going to let you down out of the wall. You're going to escape. No one's going to know you were here. But when you come back here and do those things that you do, you're not going to hurt my family. And these Israelite men, these two men say this, such a profound thing, our life for yours even unto death. We'll come back and talk about that in a minute. But, I mean, that's a significant, like they understand the moment they were in. This woman has guarded their life. They could have been taken out and killed right there on the spot, but she guarded them, and they said, look, since we could have died before, how about this? Our life for years. Think about what happens as they have to go back and go, hey, listen, um, you guys aren't going to believe this, uh, but we were in the house of a prostitute, and uh, this is what happened, and we promised her that we wouldn't kill her when we go and destroy this whole city and every living thing in it. Okay, so there's a deal. So just make sure you don't hurt her. There's a scarlet thread hanging outside of her door. Um, it's, it's this just crazy picture of what God is doing here. And when Israel destroys Jericho, they keep their word. If you go to Joshua chapter 6, um, we've forgotten kind of all about Rahab. There's this big story about Israel marching around the city for six days straight. And they march around it a whole bunch of times on the 7th. And then the walls just fall down. And they march in and they destroy and they burn everything. And, you know, that kind of... That takes the forefront of your mind, right? Not Rahab at this point. Um, but there in, in chapter 6, verses 24 and 25, it says they burned the city with fire. 
I don't know what else you'd burn it with, and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of, of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Just that little reminder that the people of God, they keep their word. They come in and they do for Rahab what they said that they would do. That did not go unnoticed in the eyes of God. And it does not go unnoticed for all of history because it is preserved here for us. So I just want to look at Rahab, the identity of this woman. It is wrapped up in one thing. You don't say Rahab without saying Rahab the prostitute. Like it, it kind of ceases to become a career path and more about who she is. This defines this woman. Rahab, the prostitute. I mean, it's just like you, you feel bad. You feel bad for her because you know like everything that you think and do has to be wrapped up in this one thing and that has to be a, such a weight of shame and guilt and failure. And I kept thinking that last week. I was just continuing to think through this story going, you can't clean this up. You can't make it nice and tidy. You can't, you can't just look over who she is and what she does. This is Rahab. And this story God is using to show who he is and what he does in rescuing people. And I, and I thought about that. Her identity is wrapped up in shame, guilt, and failure. She never, she never got paid for what she did and thought, this is what I wanted to do with my life. This is how I imagined everything turning out. I imagine every day she woke up feeling like, how do I get out? Where is the path of rescue for me? Why does this continue to be who I am? Why do I have to be consumed by this one thing? Why are these chains on me? There has to be another way. And yet every day she goes through the same process and the same things define her and it becomes more ingrained into who she is. Identity is at the heart of all of us of, of like what we're searching for. We want to find it in anything else usually but being son, daughter of God and letting that define who we are and then living out from that. Rahab wants the same thing. I think she must have felt broken down every day knowing that prostitute had essentially become her last name. And yet, she is used by God to become a part of the story that's being written. God doesn't look over her. The people of Israel don't look past her because of her past. It's really like because of who she is, I think that God ends up using her in the story. And, and, and I, I see this all through Scripture. You see people like Rahab, the Samaritan, the woman at the well, Zacchaeus, Peter, all of these sort of low-life individuals who just keep getting it wrong. These are the people that God just, you just see grace just flowing out of their life. And, and this picture of constantly, you know, their, their lives are being turned around. And it's, it's this beautiful picture of what God can do in our stories and in brokenness. Now, I quote this, this passage so much, but it continues to come to mind. Romans 5, 6 through 8. That at just the right time, while we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It is in the midst of our brokenness that God steps into our story to redeem, rescue, ransom, restore. It's in the middle of brokenness, not after we get cleaned up. And, and it's because he's a patient, pursuing, gracious, redeeming God. We want to clean our story. We want to clean this story up because we want to clean our own story up. We want to look at ourselves and go, I'm not, I'm not that bad. I mean, I'm, I'm not Rahab the prostitute. Like, nobody's calling me that. But the truth is, it's only when we accept the depth of our brokenness that we can really see grace for what it is. I think Rahab saw her rescue in the people of God. I think she saw these people coming and she goes, you used to be slaves. You're a ragtag bunch of people that have been wandering around in the desert for the last 40 years, making circles, living in tents. 
And God parted a Red Sea for you to walk across on dry land. God went before you and destroyed these two cities. Just the fact of your name being mentioned melts the heart of our people. We are scared to death of what you're about to do to our city. Not because of who you are, but because of your God. And I think Rahab looked and she said, if these people can make it, surely this God can rescue me. Surely he is powerful enough if he can part a Red Sea to rescue me from these chains that I live under every day. That's what I think about when I think about Rahab's story. The other angle I think we should see here is how Rahab found a home with the people of God. We go back to Joshua 6, verses 20, or verse 25. It says, she has lived in Israel to this day. You know what? This is exactly what should have happened to Rahab the prostitute. Back in that place where God made the covenant with Abraham, he said, Abraham, I'm blessing you to be a blessing. Those are the words, blessed to be a blessing. Not blessed to be blessed and just hang on to it, but blessed to be the conduit of love to all nations. I want to set apart a people for my name that when they hear Israel, they hear the Lord God has rescued and saved you. And they know that they too can receive rescue and they can receive saving. The purpose of Israel was to go to all nations and say there is a one true God who wants to save and rescue you and we will show you how to live. That was their purpose, not destruction. We see this in the Old Testament. They go and they destroy these cities because these people are evil and they're unrepentant. But the whole purpose the whole time was that they would bring redemption. Rahab sees this and she steps in. This picture of, of Israel looking at Rahab and saying, we know your past, but we want to give you a new identity. We want to give you a new purpose. We want you to be a part of our family. That's what Israel was supposed to be about the whole time. And yet, it, it just kind of baffles me that we as the people of God often don't live that same way. We extend judgment first. Not all of us all the time. <laughs> but think about that. Are the people in your life that are living with this past and, and are you extending the same thing that the people of Israel did here for Rahab saying, hey, we don't care about what, what's back there. We know where rescue comes from. Let me show you that rescue. Let me show you how you can live like new. Let me show you how you can live in a redeemed way, in a way that it's not defined anymore by this, the prostitute, but daughter of God, son of God. 2 Corinthians 5. I quote this passage a lot too. 2 Corinthians 5. Paul writes these words. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old identity gone. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is your job, believer. Ministry of reconciliation. It is our purpose to be extending reconciliation to those that don't know Jesus. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to themselves, not counting their trespasses against them, not counting her Rahab the prostitute anymore, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. You take a message and you go out. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Rahab's story is what God wanted the people of Israel to always be doing, reconciling and redeeming stories. So very practically, just in the next few minutes, this story, I'll tell you what it means for me. Um, I put A, and then I realized I needed an A prime. Um, God is in the business of redeeming stories, plain and simple. We can talk about this all day long. Just one sentence covers it. God is in the business of redeeming stories. Read this. It's like from beginning to end. That's, that's what it's about. God redeeming stories. Practically, God wants us to know this gospel. Rahab is a little picture of the gospel in the Old Testament. Terrible past, redeemed, part of the people of God forever. This is cool. Turn to Matthew 1. You get bored reading the genealogy of Jesus? Oh, gosh. This takes forever at Christmas, right? Kristen's granddad reads through this before we can eat, and it's like... We read it after we eat. 
the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab. What? Rahab's like the great, great, great grandmother of Jesus. <laughs> this is like the most beautiful part of this story. Here is this woman who in the Old Testament is known as the prostitute. You want to talk about identity erasing and giving something new. You made it into the line of Jesus. You're not Rahab the prostitute anymore. You're Rahab, Jesus' granny. Like this is, just blows my mind that she makes it in. Not only is she a prostitute, she's a foreigner. She's not even this purebred Jew which they pride themselves on here. Rahab the prostitute, new identity. And in her line comes the savior of the world. The gospel just passing down through history. And I thought that means that none of us are too far. We've been singing this song that, uh, that David Crowder wrote um, the past few weeks. I've been singing it over and over in my car and in the house and in my head. <laughs> but there's this line of, Wanderer, come home. You're not too far. Rahab is proof. I am proof. The gospel is that God himself came in human flesh to rescue and renew all of creation through the work of Jesus on our behalf, on your behalf. Know this gospel. This is, that's what Rahab called in a very small picture because she didn't know what was coming through her line. She didn't know this Jesus that would come, but she knew that there was a God, not a destroying God, but a God who would rescue. And she stepped into a family that gave her a new identity. And we need that same gospel. And we need it every single day. Preach the gospel to yourself daily. Don't let it be just a thing that makes you a, a, a Christian that you step into and then you forget. But every day you wake up, you're not too far. When you walk away, you're still not too far. Because Rahab was not too far. Practically, as the people of God, are we offering that same rescue to people who are in need? To people who feel like they are too far? Look at how Israel acted here. This is kingdom work. Their character became consistent with the character of God. I don't know why those two men ended up at that house other than God knew all of history and he was going to rescue her out of that life that she was in. I keep thinking, of, the walls of Jericho fall down just a few days later. Rahab lived in the wall. In my head, all the walls fell down except Rahab's house. <laughs> and she was able to walk out and say, this is my new family. I've been in so many conversations with people lately who have this picture of the church that is closed off and concealed that they can never be a part of it. And I say, no, that's not the kingdom. That's not what Jesus brought. And when, and when I explain this, that Jesus came, and there's nothing that we can do to earn that love, just like Rahab couldn't, just saying, I just need rescuing. But that's how we come to God, that he rescues us out of our sin while we were stuck in it. And you just see this, like, whew, Freedom. And I want that too. I want to wake up and feel that. That when I walk away to remember the story of this woman. To remember that every day God is rescuing me. Restoring me. Making me like him. And when I know that. To be able to walk up to anyone who doesn't yet know that and say. You can be rescued. 
You can throw off these chains. You can become son, daughter of God, beloved, because that's how he sees you. And we throw off the judgmental attitudes and we let love pour through us. How are we doing with helping people find new identities? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you um, for this picture of this woman. I thank you that Rahab is not forgotten. <laughs> that she is such a central part of the story. And she hides these spies and she gives them rescue. And Father, we thank you that we have rescue. So as we gather here this morning, Father, I pray that we would just feel our, our chains thrown off and our rescue come through Jesus and the new identity that we can find in you. So Father, help us to be a people that extend that to the world. Let judgment be the last thing that comes from our hearts. Let it never come from our hearts. And just the constant reminder that you rescued us, that you threw off our chains, and that every day we can feel that freedom, never being bound again just like Rahab was able to find a home and find a family. So we are in yours. Shape us new, Father. We say we love you. Amen. I'm just going to uh, respond for the next few moments, um, pass the buckets for our tithes and offerings, but... I just, uh, I, mean, I just want to encourage you, just as we're sitting here, um, before we sing again, just to take a few moments and either thank God for the rescue that you have, remind yourself of his mercy and grace, or beg him to let you see that fresh again, or maybe for the first time. I go through this constant frustrating battle of of telling myself that I've disappointed him. And every time I do that, he says, no. I love you. I know where it comes from. I know why I do that. But even just the last couple of days, just wrestling with that tension, letting it build in me. And I keep going back to her story. And hearing God say again, you're not too far. You'll never be too far. So just rest in that, in the silence, in these moments.